All right, excellent. I think we, we're gonna start. Um, well, today we have um, a different format, right? In the, in, the previous, in the previous day, we have hearing some wonderful lectures from experts in, in different fields, right? Uh, going from quantum simulation to quantum networking to quantum materials. So today we have a, a panel, right? And in this panel, we're gonna discuss, a, I'm actually very, uh, very happy that we have some of the national experts if they are in the area of quantum networking and, and quantum internet here with us. So then we can debrief a little bit about this topic that, you know, in the last couple of years, it's been doing the rounds a lot and people talk a lot about quantum networks and the quantum internet. So then the purpose of this panel will be that uh, through the voices of our guests today, we can uh, get a very good overview about all things that are happening in the United States right now, also in the world uh, regarding this topic. So um, the way we, we plan it is we want to make this um, an informal conversation. I'm just gonna give it a little bit of structure in the sense that I would like uh, the people that are attending the panel to learn a little bit more of different aspects of this quantum internet story. So then first we'll have uh, self introductions by the panelists where they can tell us a little bit, you know, where they're coming from, what are they doing and what is their relationship to all things quantum internet and quantum networks. And then we're gonna have a few groups of questions dedicated to then learn a little bit about different aspects of quantum networks from basic science to a little bit more details to then uh, a little bit more of like policy. What is the United States doing in this arena these days? Why is everybody so excited about this topic, right? And then, um, then there will be a time to have questions from the audience to all our panelists, right? I think in this way, then we can all uh, learn a lot of great deal of things, okay? Um, and then, well, so without any further delay, I will kindly ask um, Kathy Ann first to introduce herself and tell us a little bit more about what she's doing there in, in the Air Force Research Lab. Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? So uh, my name is Kathy Ann Soderberg and I'm a research scientist at the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York. And my background is in trapped ion quantum computing. That's what I did my PhD in. And I'm currently working on trapped ion quantum networking at AFRL, where as you'll hear today, we're working to develop a distributed test bed so that we can start to distribute entanglement, which you'll also hear about in a few minutes and learn what you can do with a, both a short range quantum network and a long range quantum network. Fantastic. I, I just heard the news that the, there was an announcement in the last few days, you know, that AFRL was, was chosen to be the laboratory to do quantum information science from the Department of Defense. Is that correct, Katia? Yes, we were named a quantum information center for the Air Force and the Space Force for the DOD. Yep, some of the other service labs uh, are their quantum information centers for their own services. Fantastic. Um, next, we have uh, Nathalie De Leon. Nathalie was very kind to give us a wonderful talk yesterday, but uh, please Nathalie, could you please uh, reintroduce yourself and tell us more about your connections to all things quantum networks and quantum internet. Sure. Um, so my name is uh, Natalie Dalian. I'm an assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering at Princeton. I've been here for about, oh gosh, five years now. <clears throat> the pandemic does weird things to mm -hmm. timing. Um, and uh, my group uh, broadly works on um, quantum technologies uh, in, you know, for quantum networks, quantum computing, and quantum sensing. Um, and about two thirds of my group works on uh, solid state defects. Um, so, uh, so in terms of the, the work that is most relevant for quantum networks, um, we have been developing a number of technologies that are relevant for quantum repeaters um, for long distance quantum networks, um, specifically in trying to discover new material systems that act as good um, single atom quantum memories. Um, uh, both in terms of new color centers in diamond and also new host materials for rare earth ions. Um, but then uh, uh, in parallel, my group is also working on integrated photonics to actually you know, develop the very strong uh, atom photon interfaces that you need to, to really make these a practical technology. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, next, 
we have uh, Kerstin Klesser Van Damme from uh, Brookhaven National Labs. Uh, please, Kerstin. Hi, uh, I'm the director of the Computational Science Initiative. You can see our building just behind me. We are responsible um, in the Department of Energy Labs um, for, for Brookhaven in looking at future technologies that can help our mission space um, to advance our scientific discovery uh, capabilities. And quantum is obviously one of the, the key technologies that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, but not just quantum uh, computing, as many would, would think about it, but quantum networking is really important. We uh, build and operate a lot of uh, leading edge uh, large scale facilities across the country and worldwide, actually. And quantum networking can play a real role there, uh, potentially in enabling us to measure better things better, more with more precision. And so we are very interested in that. Um, and, and that's why, why I'm involved. Uh, we've built a program at Brookhaven together with Eden uh, and with other collaborators. And, and we're very excited about uh, the progress that we've been able to make. Fantastic. So one of the things that I would like to point out, and you see here by the profile of our different guests, is that this topic right now is in a sense in everybody's mind, right? From the Department of Defense, from the Department of Energy, to all things uh, academia, right? Uh, there's a lot of interest. And you know, one of the things that we want to do in, in the panel today is explore a little bit as to like, wait, why is it everybody cares about this now, right? Which is a great thing. And also what kind of um, profit different institutions and different organizations can have from all these things, quantum networks and, and the quantum internet. All right, so that's, that's of course uh, super important. And okay, so now I'm gonna start uh, with some, some rapid questions uh, to, to introduce our audience to, to the topic, right? So then I'm, I'm gonna ask um, a rapid question and then I will ask each of you to tell me, um, to tell me, to tell me the answer, right? So remember, this is um, a very broad audience, so we shouldn't perhaps go too much into the details, but tell me what comes into your mind after, after I ask you the question, okay? So, the first question, and I think it is in everybody's minds, could you please tell me your definition of what the quantum internet is? Maybe let's start uh, with, with Katya. Sure. So I think a quantum internet will be a platform to connect devices that have different functions. But unlike the current internet, these devices would be quantum mechanical in nature. So you could have a memory node or some type of quantum sensor or a, an atomic clock that you wanna transfer information to another quantum node somewhere else. And then on top of that, because it's a, a quantum internet and not just our classical internet, you'll be able to do things in fundamentally different ways. And you could think to do something like teleport information across the network, which, which would provide a new capability. Excellent. Uh, Natalie? Um, yeah, I don't think I have a particular dog in the definition fight, but I would say that a, a quantum network or, or quantum internet is, uh, is any um, distributed network of nodes that allows for quantum communication um, um, or distributed entanglement. So um, sort of agnostic to the exact task that you're, uh, that you're trying to achieve. I think it's, it's sort of clear that there's this frontier of figuring out how you can how you can communicate across multiple nodes and across long distances that's sort of independent of whether you're trying to network atomic clocks for long baseline metrology or actually put you know quantum computers together or do quantum key distribution. Fantastic. Kerstin? I think you're muted, Kerstin. Someone must have done that because I didn't. <laughs> Um, so I, I think Kathy Ann's uh, definition was perfect. What, what I would add is probably to say uh, the quantum internet for me means totally secure communication and um, uh, it, communication in an instant, uh, much faster than we could do with a uh, traditional network, which helps us, for example, in, in connecting atomic clocks or things like that. And, and, and um, uh, transmitting information um, in a heartbeat, so to speak. 
right? So I think there are uh, some very important points that were mentioned there, right? Particularly, and I think it's, it's important to say, you see in, in our, in the breadth of the people that are working in this research, um, you know, sometimes physicists, we think about things as small things that we have in the lab and then we can control and we have grad students working on this. But I think this idea of the quantum internet, as you heard, it's a little bit higher, right? Basically, there was this discussion that now we're thinking about something agnostic, right? That, you know, exists there, we can design it and it does not depend on the technology that we're using. So now, now it has become really a, a, this big enterprise to, to design all kinds of systems that allows them to control the quantum hardware, even though for some users that quantum hardware might be a black box, right? And that's, that's exactly now why we're thinking about all, all these things. Um, okay, second rapid question. Uh, you already mentioned there uh, some of the uses of the quantum internet. And I think one of the most important things is this concept of uh, entanglement, right? So maybe you can um, perhaps quickly tell us, first of all, if you wanna give it a, a touch there, what is this quantum entanglement? How does it materialize in, in quantum networks? And, and what can we do with it, right, a little bit? Now let's go the other way around. Maybe let's start with uh, with Kirsten first. Oh my God, you're gonna ask me to explain entanglement. <laughs> no, from your perspective, right? No, this is wonderful. It, it is coming back to, to what I said, instantaneous connection between two, two different geographically distributed points. I think that's that's probably the, the best thing to, to, to think about it. So you have the same information in instantaneously in, in different uh, locations. Fantastic, Natalie. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's like sort of important, especially for a broad audience to demystify some of these terms. Um, I think entanglement can sound like one of these things that's really difficult to understand. And there's, there's a core of it that is very difficult to understand for sure. But um, there's a lot of pieces of it around that that are just, um, you know, like it's also very counterintuitive that Bayesian probability works the way that it does. Um, so I, I would say that maybe it's easier to think about it from a technological standpoint, that entanglement allows you uh, to do things that you would not otherwise be able to do classically, um, that you can sort of use it as a resource because uh, it fundamentally ties together the measurement outcomes of um, you know, all of your entangled particles or your entangled states uh, in a way that allows for new protocols for how to distribute information and how to communicate with each other. Wonderful. Uh, KTN? Sure, yeah, I think Kirsten and Natalie both did a great job. I, I always think of entanglement as a very special relationship between two particles such that they remain perfectly correlated no matter how far apart they get. And so what this can allow you to do is that if you act on one of the particles, say you make a measurement, then you change the state of the other particle. And if I were to have two entangled particles and I gave one to Aiden and I kept one, the moment that I measured mine, I would know the state of his particle without having to ask him. Um, this doesn't give you faster than light communication, but it's because we know before they go apart that they're entangled, that we can share information in this much different way than you're able to classically. Fantastic. No. Hey, this is great. I, I think these are, as, as Natalie was pointing out, right? It's important to demystify um, how this is gonna work and what are the things that, that we, can, we can do, right? And we, can, we cannot do with it. Um, so touching upon that, and remember again, this is all from your perspective, right? This is what is important that we have the panel to learn different things from different people, right? Uh, you already touched upon this um, a little bit. Um, what type of information can we exchange if you have an um, entanglement-based system as you were describing? Right now, you know that you have two particles and then if you make a measurement in one, the other one will react, right? And then we have to do some other measurements so we cannot do this faster than light. Perfect, fine. But what kind of information can we exchange? You know, what kind of information perhaps will be of use for the different applications that, you know, the different organizations have in mind? So maybe let's start there with, uh, with Natalie. Uh, yeah, so I, I hope that this doesn't make this field sound um, a lot less sexy, but the way that I think about uh, using entanglement as a resource is that fundamentally it's sort of like a one-time pad. Um, so, you know, like in, in classical cryptography, 
if I just hand you a pad that says, you know, this, this key corresponds to this, this key corresponds to that, and then we only use it once and we just agree we're just going to use it that one time, then in principle, it's extremely secure as long as you had a good chain of custody for that, for that one time pad. So kind of similarly, these uh, measurement outcomes when you have some distributed uh, entanglement are, you know, probabilistic. So there's no way for me to like deterministically communicate something with you, but we, because we share an outcome, we now share something that looks like a key that we can use to decrypt classical information. So I can just send you information otherwise. And then, uh, and then, you know, we both have this, have this shared key. I think that's like the, the oldest protocol that, that people talk about, but then of course there are uh, maybe more modern, you know, proposals for how how you would use uh, the sort of distributed entanglement to do things like modular quantum computing, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Katie Ann there, something that will be, for example, of um, interest to the Department of Defense, the Air Force, the Space Force, where are we gonna use this entanglement communications for? Yeah, we are interested in, I always call them beyond QKD applications, so quantum key distribution is a pretty well understood application at this point. But one thing we want to research is if you can just distribute entanglement in this in this different way than, than what's been done before, how can you use that and what advantage does it give you? And so one thing you might think to do with it is something like teleportation, which I said before. So that's not teleporting physical objects like in, in Star Trek. Um, that would be awesome, but we can't do that. It's teleporting information over a quantum channel between point A and point B or, or multi-point if, if you have more than two entangled particles. And so, I, you know, I personally would like to find out what are the limitations on what you can do with teleportation and, and how far can you take that? And so people unfamiliar with teleportation, if you have entangled particles, you can do some other single qubit operations once you share that entanglement to actually teleport information from point A to point B. And you don't need a classical channel to do that. You do need a classical channel always to to share information about the measurements, but the information itself goes over this quantum channel, which is more protected than a classical channel ever could be. And so I find that really fascinating. Fantastic. And then uh, maybe Kirsten, a little bit from the perspective of, of DOE, right? Uh, now we're thinking, and as he was already said, cryptographically protected exchange of keys. Now we're thinking about exchanging information using a new highway which is this uh, entanglement highway that Cathy Ann was mentioning. Why the Department of en Energy is so interested in using this? And what do you see applications that could come five, 10, 15 years from now? Yeah, I think that there's two, two quite different uh, things that we are interested in. Um, as, so one is, is measurements. And, and we are thinking, for example, of astronomy of telescopes, um, that quantum enabled telescopes uh, spread across the world that are looking up at the sky for, for different measurements. Um, if we can connect them and, and uh, distribute the measurements instantaneously, it allows us to get a much better picture of what is going on uh, in the sky. The same would apply to, to other measurements like that. So we are, Brookhaven is working, for example, on a quantum enabled LIDAR. LIDARs are things that are looking up at the clouds at the weather systems that we have above, above us. But at the moment they are single systems and then you have to connect them afterwards. If we could do this instantaneously, we could redirect them, we can have them measure things more precisely, allowing us to, to look much better at the weather than we can do today. So those are applications that we are very excited about and why we're interested. But the other role of the DOE is, is obviously um, energy, the energy infrastructure and securing it. Um, and we've all heard about um, the, the recent attacks on, on our energy systems. Um, and so secure communication in, in the post uh, quantum world, so to speak, is, is obviously something that, that's highly important to us to, to secure what, what we have in the nation. That was, that was really wonderful. Three different perspectives about what this quantum internet can do. So, you know, a few messages to, to put in there for, for the people that are for a first time learning about this, right? Um, I think we touched upon something that is very, very important, which is this concept of uh, quantum internet of things. Right, and then they mentioned already five or six different things that if we actually build these entanglement-based quantum networks, 
we're going to be able to do. So not that I was not already excited, but just by hearing this, I'm getting even more excited about building these things and really see if we can get these, um, get these applications going. Um, okay, so that was, um, there is a, there's a couple of questions from, from the audience that then uh, will then trigger our next, our next set of questions. So then in, in the next set, sets of questions, um, I'm just gonna pose a question out there and you know whoever wants to address it, then you can do it, right? But um, Kirsten, you did mighty well. So I'm gonna give you a PhD in quantum networking any moment. <laughs> so uh, fantastic. So here, here's a question, which, which was a question that I wanted to ask to, to start this sort of more in-depth Q and A period. So David, David Liu is asking us, um, which qubit technology is most promising for quantum networks? Um, and then, well, I, I leave that uh, I leave that out there, and then you you can tell us what maybe perhaps give us an overview about what's available, and you know in your in your mind uh, what some of the ones that are more more promising. Mm -hmm. So the floor is open. Who wants to go first? I can go first. All right, Kathy. Yeah, so there's a, many qubit technologies that can be used for networking, mostly any qubit technology that can be used for quantum computing is a good one for quantum networking because these quantum networks ultimately are going to be very small information processors. My favorite is trapped ions because, of course, that's my background. They also happen to be one of the leading candidates to realize a quantum computer. And that's mostly due to the level of control you can have over both the, the external degrees of freedom of the qubit and the internal. And you need both to be able to do quantum operations well. Some other promising ones are superconducting qubits, uh, integrated photonics, and NV centers in diamond and, and cold atoms. And they all have benefits and drawbacks. And so a lot of that will depend on what application you wanna have, and you'll pick the qubit technologies within the network likely that will best get you to that end application with the least amount of noise. Excellent. Natalie, you, would you like to uh, chime in in that one? Yeah, I mean, so in principle, all that you need is um, something that can connect to photons. So usually you're looking at things that look like atoms or ions um, or solid state defects. Um, but uh, more recently, I guess there's been there's been some effort on trying to do microwave to optical transduction um, from superconducting qubits. So I guess I wouldn't really call them natural quantum network qubits necessarily, but there is a, a you know a robust project to try to develop that interface in a in a low noise way. Um, I don't know if it ever makes sense to like pick winners because um, it's a very uh, you know, we're we're definitely in the stage of the technology where it is more like the 1940s for com for classical computing um, than the 1960s, uh, where there's there's no um, you know clear platform that it makes sense to uh, invest in heavily. Um, I guess I'll just mention that a lot of the um, early demonstrations of distributed entanglement um, or of remote entanglement were done in trapped ions. Um, so that's uh, clearly a, a very mature platform. Um, there's also a lot that people do with just sort of classical-ish <laughs> linear optics, you know, like doing uh, just entangled pair sources or very weak lasers. Um, and uh, and there's been this beautiful work out of out of China, right, where they where they have these long distance uh, quantum networks. But I would say that um, most of what they're doing is really just sort of a demonstration uh, in that there's not a clear path to take what they've demonstrated and turn it into a more scalable um, high bandwidth network. So sort of all of the pieces that they've put together, maybe we already sort of understood like 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and then uh, as Kathy had mentioned, um, you, know, so, you know, some of the most sophisticated demonstrations uh, recently have been done in color centers and diamond. Like you have this beautiful work out of Ronald Hansen's group at Delft um, and uh, and Nisha Lukin's group at Harvard, um, where they've achieved you know some sort of record in terms of entanglement bandwidth, uh, and then some sort of record in terms of just absolute cooperativity. So I think those are clearly very promising systems. Fantastic, Kerstin, you want to add yeah. to that? 
Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit to that. I, I, I completely agree that there's so many technologies out there. Um, maybe Eden can even put uh, the, a link to our report. So we had a workshop just before the, the pandemic stroke in uh, February to, uh, 2020 on quantum networking. It was called the Blueprint Workshop, and we, we uh, created a report. I had many um, experts uh, from f across the US there at the workshop. And, and one of the things that was really came out is there's so many technologies, we, we can't pick a winner at the moment. We don't know what the right technology is. And, and I think it's not just that you have to, to show that it works now, but can we produce it in, um, in large enough quantities? Is it stable if you want to operate it in, in a network that you actually want to use, not just for a one-off measurement? So all those kind of things come in. And so we will certainly pursue quite a number of these, these options, see how they, they interact with each other. And then sort of as, as the um, technology level progresses, think about which ones might be the best ones to take forward. Excellent. So, well, I mean, you hear it from the experts, and I think that's, um, in general, the, the opinion that exists right now is that this is a time of discovery, right? It's not a time to start choosing winners, just as Kerstin said there, but rather to push the science and what else can we do, right, to make these systems. I think that's a key word there that was mentioned, scalable. And the second one, stable, right? So then you can operate them. And then this links to the, to the next question that I, that I wanted to ask. Right, that is basically something that was mentioned. As uh, Natalie did, said, many of these technologies, at least in concept and through the last couple of decades in experimental realizations, are starting to get well understood. Right, there is still a lot to discover, but we kind of know. So now I I seen, and this is my experience, but I want the um, the, the experts to comment. Um, I seen that now there is um, kind of like a next generation experiments that people are putting together where now we're building small network realizations that can be at the lab level or perhaps a little bit bigger than the lab level, maybe you know, intercity with a few kilometers in between and, and so forth. So perhaps can you comment um, the, these test beds that you know, can you, can you tell us a little bit about them and where are they being built currently? Um, Natalie, would you like to, to start there? I might not be the best person to, to answer this. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I casually know about a number of test beds. Um, you know, obviously, Eden and, and Kirsten are, are involved in, in one of them. Um, and then there's another one in um, the Boston area um, and maybe one in UIUC or something like that. I'm sure that I just offended a large number of people. Um, <laughs> I think, I think um, you know, t test beds are um, uh, are a very interesting direction because I think, uh, uh, okay, what I guess one of one of the things that really appeals to me about this field is that it is true that we're in this kind of era of fundamental discovery, but at the same time, um, we have very clear goals, right? So it's clear what kinds of things we're trying to accomplish and how you parameterize success. So, you know, you can't make kind of weird amorphous claims to novelty and say like, this is interesting just for the sake of being interesting. You know, we actually have things that we're trying to achieve. So I think the thing that the test beds really lend to that overall project is giving people clear ways to compare their technologies and benchmark them. Um, I would say that the challenge of, a, of test beds from my perspective is, um, you either need to build them for a very particular technology, you know, and just say, we're going to do this demonstrator based on, uh, because you have to make a lot of choices. You have to make a lot of engineering choices about how exactly you're going to build this test bed. Um, and, uh, uh, or you need to build something that's maybe not as powerful um, from a demonstrator perspective, but is a little bit more multi-purpose where you can have it be you know, something that's more technology agnostic. And I think that's a, that's a trade-off that people think about and maybe speaks to, you know, there being some need for multiple types of, of test beds as opposed to just sort of building one giant thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe Natalie, could you please tell us more about uh, the things that you're building there in Princeton? I, you, yesterday you showed us um, a wonderful collaboration team in which many different persons are 
given a different type of expertise and you have a very particular um, technology platform that looks very promising. Could you tell us more about that? Because I thought it was very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, so I mean, um, I guess uh, my um, uh, perspective on this is that what I'm interested in doing is trying to advance the what I think is the most interesting technological frontier. And I'm pretty um, uh, ambivalent about what field that happens, that frontier happens to exist in. Um, so sometimes it's in integrated photonics, sometimes it's in materials, sometimes it's in you know, fundamental spectroscopy, sometimes it's in integrating very large scale systems. Um, so, so far, you know, the, the main kind of roadblock that I think we have identified and, and really worked on um, is just the lack of um, viable candidates for uh, single atom quantum repeater, quantum memories for quantum repeaters, um, right? There's, there's a number that people um, have been able to do sort of small scale demonstrations on, but we also um, can very, very clearly parameterize what's wrong with all of them and why it is that, that you know, what you're doing is, is sort of very limited. So the broad collaboration at Princeton is actually mostly working on that frontier, um, which is how do we look for new material systems and how do we screen them much more rapidly and, uh, and you know, much more effectively um, because historically, you know, physicists will just sort of wait around for somebody to hand them a sample that they say this this might look interesting and then they do a little bit of characterization and get their first five or six nature papers out of it um, and that's you know not a very good basis for uh, being able to just design something and optimize it um, so that's sort of that the the collaboration that I outlined was um, my group, uh, Steve Lyon, who's an expert at uh, cryogenic and highly sensitive electron spin resonance, so it's sort of a spectroscopy pipeline. Uh, Bob Kava, who is a solid state chemist who thinks um, you know, very deeply about how to synthesize different host materials, how to purify them, how to think about crystallographic defects and impurities uh, in all of these uh, materials. Um, and uh, Jeff Thompson's group, uh, who works on um, you know, rare earth ions for quantum communication um, or, and quantum networks. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, the main kind of large scale effort that's happening at Princeton. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Do you guys have plan to um, get some fiber going and maybe connect Princeton somewhere else? New York I think City, it, so then we can connect to you yeah. guys. <laughs> I think if we get to a stage where we can really show that we have um, high bandwidth spin photon entanglement and it looks like there's a path mm -hmm. minimally you know we'll get like 50 kilometers of fiber stick it in our lab in a big spool <laughs> you know something yeah, like yeah. that and then you know just try the first thing but then um yeah i we, we don't have any concrete plans for going beyond that first lab scale demonstration fantastic hey katie can you tell us a little bit more about uh the test bed that you're building up upstate and maybe some other test beds that might be built um, that are of interest to the Department of Defense. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So at AFRL, we're working on a distributed quantum networking test bed. And in the beginning, we're gonna focus on three technologies, which are trapped ions, superconducting qubits, and integrated photonic circuits. So those are the three hardware groups that we have within AFRL in Rome, New York. Uh, we also have some quantum work that's spread out across the other technical directors in different parts of the US that in the future may uh, join this distributed network. But in the beginning, we wanna focus on these three technologies and learn how to distribute entanglement in at least a three node network. And a big piece of our work is the heterogeneous. So that means a different type of qubit that sits at each network node. And how do you distribute entanglement between three very different qubit technologies and um, quantum frequency convert, or some people call it quantum transduce the information between those three very different qubit technologies. And we have three parts of our test bed. One is for fundamental explorations. It's in our new Innovari Advancement Center. And the idea there is to explore these fundamental questions about how to distribute entanglement, how to verify entanglement, what can you do once you distribute entanglement across a multi-node network. And then uh, there's a second piece of the test bed. So the first piece will see development into the more applied piece that happens in our AFRL facility itself. And here the attention then turns to uh, more of a DOD focus where the DOD eventually has to deploy these technologies out into the field because they have to go to the warfighter 
at the end of the day when this technology is eventually ready to be handed off to the warfighter. And so we have to spend a lot of our time thinking about how we might be able to do that. How do you take this very basic fundamental research experiment and shrink it down and make it more robust? Um, and we'll do that in our in-house labs. And then the third leg of the test bed that we have is actually test sites. So to take quantum outside of the laboratory and test it in a real world environment, which again, there's a lot of learning to do there because most of these demonstrations have happened within a pristine, well-controlled laboratory environment. So as we start to take them out and field test them, we're gonna learn a lot that we need to do differently. And then we can take it back either to the, the fundamental part of the test bed or the more applied part of the test bed, depending on the problem that has to be solved. So that's our locally what we're working on. Eventually we wanna expand this test bed to be a part user facility where others with different qubit technologies or even classical technologies that need to be connected onto the network could come and plug into our network in a, in a longer term vision. And then, you know, eventually we hope to connect up to Brookhaven or Stony Brook um, in a longer range network using some of the same technology. Well, now, definitely I'm, I'm getting very excited about connecting to the Air Force and to Princeton down the line. Hopefully in 10 years from now, we're, we have another panel where we're discussing all these uh, technologies there, right? Um, a follow-up yeah, question to you. <laughs> that would be great, Katie Ann. Um, you mentioned about the, the interest in bringing some of this technology uh, for well applications in, in, in the OD and perhaps even the field. Do, do you ambition perhaps a, a future in which, you know, the F-35s of the Air Force and so forth are quantum connected? Yeah, potentially. So mm -hmm. as the Air Force Research Lab, for those unfamiliar, we are the, let's call it basic and early applied research wing of the Air Force. And our, our mission is to develop technologies that will eventually help the warfighter, um, you know, as the Department of Defense. And so, yes, we have to think about how to transition technologies into things like F-35s, which is a, a lot of fun to think about, but challenging from a, <laughs> a lab perspective. <laughs> I would like to be the one installing the technology in the F-35s just to at least see them, <laughs> see them close. This is wonderful. <laughs> Kirsten, um, could you please tell us, we know that um, the Department of Energy has been extremely active in the last three years on this, and that there are plans for a few test beds around the United States uh, that are national lab centric. Um, could you please tell us more about them and, you know, in which stage they are, what they're doing and, and who's involved? Yeah, there's basically two uh, developments that are currently going on. One is in the Chicago area between two of the national labs that we have there and, and a university partner. And uh, the, the second one is here between Stony Brook and Brookhaven. And um, I think what they bring to the table is um, we all have uh, test beds within our labs. Um, for Brookhaven, we, we are very lucky. We have quite a bit of networking on site. So we have an 18 kilometer loop that we can test things out in where things are under our control. But then we also have a 90 mile um, connection to uh, Stony Brook um, out there in the world with all the, the challenges of traffic and, and um, other things interfering with a network connection that allow us to test things out in, in real life and all the things that we thought would be, oh yeah, that will be fine, we find uh, are not quite so easy and, and we have to find solutions for it. So that's really great. I think what, what I hope we will be able to do in, in the not too distant future is do what the DOE does best and create facilities out of it. Uh, have a test bed where others can come because it, it building quantum uh, network test beds is not not a cheap uh, undertaking. And if you are a university group or a small research group anywhere um, that's developing a, a particular device, building then a network around it to test it can can be quite expensive. So what we would like to do is really offer our test beds for others to come integrate their technology and test it out. Um, with, with us so um, that, that they don't have to have the startup cost. And it enables us to see new technologies, to see what, how they're working, where, where the benefit is in those technologies and learn from each other. And I think that will be a really exciting phase to, to, to have all those um, uh, people come on site. We have also quite a bit of interest from, from industry already in, in using such a test bed. So, so I think that, that will be really exciting. Wonderful. 
I think that's a key word that I want to, to keep there and to have all our uh, participants have in their mind, right? Exciting. There are so many things happening. There are so many people interested. We already start thinking about building facilities where people can come and work together. It seems like the next decade is going to be a wonderful time uh, to be doing these, these kinds of things. So there's a few questions from the audience. So then I'll, I'll, I'll set my interpretation of the question and then, and then you can chime in uh, to answer, right? Um, so David Liu is, uh, is asking, uh, what do you think about QTech uh, in Delft um, and the quantum network technology and realizations that they have been uh, doing there in the last few years? Could you please comment on this? Maybe, maybe Natalie, you wanna comment on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a you know a really uh, beautiful uh, experiment and, and set of work. Um, I guess you know previously we were sort of talking about the difference between um, trying to build a demonstration based on a single technology where you can really hammer out all of the engineering for that single technology versus things that are more versatile. Um, and the QTech demonstrator is clearly in the let's build on, on top of a single uh, technology kind of demonstrator. And I think that that's allowed them to do very sophisticated things. Um, and I think just the exercise of seeing, you know, what exact, how do we account for our losses? What's the biggest source of noise? Um, how do we think about uh, quantum frequency conversion in this context and what are going to be the real practical uh, limitations of that, I think has been immensely important for the community um, just because you know, it takes a lot to actually do something. It's sort of easy mm -hmm. to publish a paper saying that this, you know, paves the way towards something, but then actually putting all of the pieces together is, uh, is, uh, is very, very important. Fantastic. Um, does anybody would like to add a little bit more to, to that? I, I, I yes, think maybe yes. maybe the what I also liked very much they they did a bit of both so they they did the practical um, demonstration but they've also really thought long term you know what what protocols do I need what is the network stack that we will have and so there there is a framework there that we can all contribute to and work in which which helps because I think that's one of the things that we will have to find in the near future is to maybe not standards, but sort of commonalities so that we can have more of a plug and play of technologies within quantum networks and quantum test beds. Uh, and starting to, certainly at the higher levels to think about how do we do this? How do we control such a quantum network? Those, those kind of things. And I think they will be an important partner in, in, in that work. And maybe I would also add that um, I think one of the um, specific directions that uh, maybe not, not only QTech, but QTech plus their broader research community has really catalyzed thinking about is, you know, how much local error correction can you do at a particular quantum network node? And I think this is one of these ideas that uh, really became very fruitful in the specific context of the physical system that they were looking at, right? That you have this sort of natural quantum register that's built up out of your thing that connects to photons, but then you have all these local nuclear spins that you can use um, as, as much longer lived memories. Um, so I think some of the like third generation quantum repeater schemes that you know people talk about uh, are really born out of thinking seriously about what are the opportunities in this particular platform and you know how can we generalize them. Fantastic. M maybe something to add there, right? Is um, you know um, the two. Delft is the leader of the, the flagship program in the European Union, right? I think they have this catchy name, it's called the Quantum Internet Alliance, right? So then all these things that you have mentioned, which is for the first time in, in a complete package, so to say, with many people uh, working together, try to think not only about the physical systems, but also all the computational and networking aspects of how to build these testbeds, as Kerstin was mentioned, what at the same time, looking at the opportunities in different spaces that you can use to improve the physics when you are already thinking uh, about how to build a network, right? And I think this has this very fancy term these days that is called co-design. I think that's, that's an example. And I think that's something that uh, I think those guys are doing, are doing extremely well, right? So kudos to them, for sure, for sure. Uh, here's, a, here's another question. Uh, this question is from uh, Pauia. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, 
So the question is about uh, measurements in, in quantum networks, right? Uh, so basically the question is, in order to extract the information, the quantum information, one eventually needs to do a measurement somewhere and average over all measurements. Uh, how does that relate to the non-cloning theorem of quantum mechanics? How do we go around that non-cloning theorem when we are building quantum networks and, and quantum internet testbed? So who wants to answer that? I think it, I think it's, it calls maybe for a connection to quantum repeaters. Mm -hmm. I think I don't entirely understand the question um, because there's nothing that's fundamentally incompatible between averaging your measurement results and the no cloning theorem. So maybe I don't really understand where the question is coming from exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question perhaps could be interpret as um, how do you build networks that don't violate the non-cloning theorem? Uh, yeah, well, okay, right. So so you're never really just copying your state. Um, the idea is that you just distribute entanglement and then use that entanglement as a resource for something like teleportation. Um, so there's, you know, there's no sense in which you are, you're really measuring your state and then reproducing it and then sending it on, a, sending it on its way. Um, and then in the context of, um, I guess, yeah, these quantum repeater schemes, the idea is that um, instead of instead of doing your measurement and then repeating it, you uh, do entanglement swapping. So you just build up a network of entangled nodes um, and, then, uh, and then swap entanglement so that you entangle more and more distant nodes. And then in the end, you get to whatever endpoints you wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. um, anybody, anybody else wants to chime in on that? I mean, I guess now that we're talking about it, can we talk about um, these quantum repeaters? Why these quantum repeaters are now also super important? Um, maybe, maybe there, Cathy Ann, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah, there's fundamental limits on how far you can send single photons that have quantum information in them. And that's because the, if you try and do it over free space or fiber, essentially the information decoheres uh, once you get to a certain distance. You know, people have sent them a few hundred kilometers. And so if you want to do a longer distance quantum network than that, then you need to build these things called repeaters. Whereas Natalie said, you're essentially, um, you know, you're not copying the entanglement, you're, you're distilling it, and then you can pass it along to the next node. You know, so you're sending quantum information from one node to the next, and then the repeater, you know, maybe you could think of it as error corrects any, anything that went wrong in the transmission and then you send it on to the next node. And in this way, you can keep repeaters going for long distances and in principle send information from say New York to California. Uh, though that's difficult in practice today. <laughs> mm -hmm. No one, so I guess I should also say, no one's actually ever demonstrated a repeater yet in a lab or, or elsewhere. And that's one of the main things that folks in quantum networking are working on right now is this fundamental repeater demonstration so that you can see how viable it is to send quantum information over long distances. Fantastic. Kerstin, would, would you like to chime in on that one? Yeah, no, I think what, what Kathy Ann said and, and what Natalie explained were, were exactly the right things. What, what we see today in, in longer distance networks as we can see them in, in, in uh, China, uh, what, what they do is exactly what uh, the, the questioner was asking about. They, they have trusted node where they measure when, when the signal arrives and then they send it on to the next one. And obviously that's not what, what we want. This is just our st interim step because we can't do, do the repeaters yet. And, and so what we want is really connecting the endpoints securely without copying and pasting what what uh, we are sending. So in that it's it's fundamentally different from what you would have in a classical network. Fantastic and hey that's great because it actually ties to to the next question uh, from Akash. Uh, he asked in your opinion he she asked in your opinion when will practical quantum key distribution networks could become a reality? And perhaps maybe that's a little bit of the discussion that Kirsten already started. Perhaps we can comment on what can people do in that area and what is what we will actually like to do, right? So um, 
maybe Katian, you wanna you wanna give it a you wanna go there. How is it is the sure. Air Force interested in this problem? So we're less interested in quantum key distribution and more interested in beyond quantum key distribution applications. Um, it's not that we're not interested in key distribution. We just want to explore this other research area of entanglement distribution. So for quantum key distribution, you can use entanglement, but you don't really need to. Mm -hmm. I would say that key distribution, quantum key distribution is the most mature of the quantum technologies. Uh, you know, people have demonstrated this for pr probably a decade or more now. And you can actually buy commercial QKD systems that people use um, in labs and, and for short distance uh, key generation. So I, I think it's pretty pretty mature now. Um, practical, that, that may be a different argument to have, um, but certainly it's well understood and, and people are pushing in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Natalie, can you perhaps tell us your opinion on, on QKD? Is this, is this something that we would like to go after or is this something that as China is already lots of developments there, maybe it's not so interesting for us. I mean, I, I think it's clear that if we could solve the long distance multiple nodes problem, that QKD is going to be one of the applications of that technology. Um, there's a lot of demand for having provably secure communication channels for a variety of, of purposes, both you know, in, uh, in defense uh, and, and also in you know, finance, for example. Um, so um, in terms of like, when will it become a reality? As Kathy Ann said, it's sort of already a reality. And I think the question is, you know, what you want to do is just parameterize it in terms of distance and bandwidth. Um, so like how, how far can you do? So if, if I wanted to do QKD to the office down the hall, um, because that was a really important link for some reason, we could just do that right now. Uh, we could do it with sort of reasonable bandwidth, but certainly not enough to do like all of our bank tra transactions or whatever in the country. Um, and uh, so, so the real question from a fundamental technology perspective is how, how can you make technologies that allow you to get to distances of, you know, say hundreds of kilometers um, and, uh, and how do you make things that are high enough bandwidth that they can actually be, um, you know, applicable for, for whatever application that you're, you're really targeting. Mm -hmm. And then maybe Kirsten, you, you already touched upon this a little bit, but um, we say that protecting the energy infrastructure in the United States, particularly in view of recent events, is that, is that a big interest from the Department of Energy to protect all kinds of infrastructure? And I think along the lines of that, quantum cryptography could be an important tool. What do yes, you abs yes, absolutely. That, that's something we are very much interested in, uh, securing the communication that is happening between the uh, infrastructure out there, uh, any, anywhere in the country, and, and the um, places where, 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 where we're monitoring and steering and, uh, and maintaining this, this operation. So, so that is something that is, is very critical to us and where we are interested. But it's also... Um, with the, the um, advent of quantum computing, um, the ability to, to decrypt information becomes much, much higher. And that, that uh, is, a, is a risk for the country. Um, and so what people are looking for is uh, quantum resistant uh, uh, cryptography. And um, Obviously, the initial thing is just to look at the, the static data that sits somewhere. I need to encrypt it in a way that um, no one can get at it. But, but in the end, we are not just storing data wherever we have it. We, we want to move data. We want to analyze data. And so you need to connect these things together. You have somewhere where you store information. You have encrypted it. You want to send it somewhere and then analyze it and keep it secure along the way and quantum networking is one of the key building blocks in that. Uh, other technologies is privacy preserving computing that we are uh, in particular for artificial intelligence, for example, that we're developing at Brookhaven that then takes uh, whatever data is there, works on it without exposing the data or the models that, that are used to do that. And then you send the results back. And again, there you need the quantum networking to keep it secure. That is fantastic. Um, there, there's a couple of um, uh, couple of things to add. 
um, last year, there was, a, there was a beautiful demonstration of quantum cryptography systems already apply in the field in the context of protecting um, energy, in this case, power infrastructure. Uh, it, was, it was done in the beautiful city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it was a project combined, sponsored by, by the CSAR division of the Department of Energy in which uh, different teams, right? From Oak Ridge, from Los Alamos, and also from a company in California that is Cubitech, they put together their quantum cryptography systems that they were developing house. And then they brought them there to, to Chattanooga and then they connect them, right? Each of them can do something like 10 kilometers or so. But then by putting them together, of course, with this trusted node in between, right? Which is our um, intermediate technological step, if you wish, they were then able to communicate uh, key rates between two power units, right? Distributed in the in the city of Chattanooga. I think that as a concept was was really really wonderful, and it shows that uh, eventually this is the kind of thing that we would like to do with our uh, very critical infrastructure, right? And the second thing is something that um, Cathy Ann mentioned is when you solve the problems in entanglement distribution, right? Such as building this quantum repeater that everybody wants to see, or like discovering how to move entanglement, you actually solve the problems to a scale quantum cryptography, right? And I think this is why it's so important to do research in these entanglement stories, because if you solve the problems there, by default, you solve the problems in quantum cryptography because the measurements are very similar and the problems are similar also. So then those are excellent opportunities. I think they go hand to hand, right? So this is why it's, um, it's great to, to do this. Okay, now uh, one, uh, one further question on technology and you have already mentioned this a little bit. What are the technological needs that we need to overcome in order to connect different technologies? So then say, for example, imagine that Natalie is gonna develop this wonderful uh, artificial single atom network in Princeton. And then Cathy Ann is gonna have those ion networks working in, in Rome, New York. And maybe here on Long Island, we're gonna have a network where we have atomic systems interconnected. So what are the challenges and what are the technology that we have to develop so we can make all of these different technologies talk into a single large test bed? Natalie, you wanna you wanna start that one? I might have the most politically incorrect answer to it, so I don't you, know if you want to start. Go ahead, me, don't but, worry about it. This is what we want to hear. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I, I think I don't really see why you would want to do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think. Um, sorry, I have to think about this a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm. I think um, you know it makes sense right now to look at many different technologies. But then ultimately, you know, we only have one. Okay, okay, this isn't entirely true. I was going to say we only have one kind of transistor, but obviously we have things like power transistors, and um, you know, for special. So you'll you'll always have like special use cases. But I think in general, once you get to a point where you're trying to scale, I think I think you just sort of have to pick one platform and and go with it because the the upstream engineering is so hard that I don't think it's trivial to just say like, we're going to be technology agnostic for ever. So then maybe there's a near term question of whether or not you learn anything by trying to network these things together. And I don't know if I'm just too small minded on this point, but I don't really see what exactly you would learn. So maybe someone else should chime in. All right, but say your opinion will be that if you wanna scale, the way to scale is basically you pick one platform and then you have to do the overhead engineering of this to scale it, right? That, that of course, one respectable opinion, right? And this is why we are in this panel because we don't have solutions for everything, which is wonderful, right? Otherwise we could all just go home, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so let's hear uh, from, from Cathy Ann, what they're doing there in, in, in AFRL. I mean, they have this picture of trying to bridge things together. And of course, um, agreeing to disagree is a great thing. Right? Yeah, I, so I see it a little bit differently. I think ultimately a quantum network will be something that can connect different types of devices and you'll probably want to connect different types of devices. So that's where why we're interested in the heterogeneous piece. Um, you know, the ions are excellent memory. 
uh, the integrated photonics are going to be the natural information carrier. And then we think the superconducting qubits are, you're able to more rapidly process information uh, with those. Uh, the ions are a little bit slower. So I, I think in the end, you're going to want to be able to connect different types of devices so that you can make full use of the quantum network, much like the internet today, right, connects many different types of devices. Mac computers can talk to, to Windows computers and, and whatnot. Um, and so that, that's how I think of it, um, a little bit differently. Uh, I think it would be easier if they're all the same device, Natalie, if it's all the same qubit technology. I don't disagree with you, but I think there's some benefit in exploring the heterogeneous connections as well. Yeah, I think if, if you want to build a, um, a scalable network fast, going with a single technology, as Natalie said, is, is definitely the easiest way of going. I, I would totally agree. but. Um, we don't know who the winner is. And, and to some extent, what, what's interesting in, in connecting different technologies and see, is actually seeing how difficult is it? And is, is there a point to it? Is, does it? Do we learn something from it? Do, do we learn, for example, that those two technologies should never be put together in a network because it's just an absolute nightmare, whereas others are much easier to bring together? And, and those could be technologies that you have at the same time. So, so set boundary conditions to some extent in terms of what's possible and what, what is worthwhile pursuing and where you should just do, should, shouldn't try, at least not, not for now. Um, I think that those are different things that we would want to find out. Well, okay, here's maybe one impetus or an analogy that makes sense to me in terms of heterogeneous integration, um, right? Like when you think about how the way the internet works, you have um, computers uh, as the endpoints but the end servers and things like that. But then there's a lot of things that look like routers, you know, very different types of hardware in between. Um, so I guess when I say it seems like you would just want a single technology, I think what I'm talking about, and I'm a little bit out of my depth on what exactly the internet is, because every time I think about it, I get very confused. <laughs> but um, but uh, that... Uh, what I'm talking about is like the router that you, you know, you ultimately, you sort of want a single protocol, a single technology, um, and then that's going to have to be the backbone of your network. But then maybe you have some endpoint that can be different depending on what task you're trying to accomplish. Um, like if you're trying to network together quantum computers for modular quantum computing, then that's clearly a different kind of thing from building a quantum repeater. Right. Excellent. I mean, this is this is an important question. You hear the experts. There is debate between the experts about what is the way to go. I think everybody agrees that for now, and maybe we'll talk about with Katya in a little bit. Um, we need to build test beds of the right size, where we can test and really test and test and further test the technology, right? And then at some point in the near future, um, you know, this country likes standards and standardization. Eventually, we have to take decisions, so then we can go into this type of uh, quantum internet standards that then can make heterogeneous networks work, right? So in a sense, it's, it's still a debate, right? And it's, it's very healthy that it's still the way. Um, okay, here's a, couple of, here's a couple of questions from the, from, from the audience. Uh, Bharat asks, for a distributed quantum network, what physical system is the one that has the most pot potential to realize it? Would it involve uh, pure photonic entangled photons or will it will involve a combination of that and matter, matter qubits where you can then process the entanglement? I can go first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think as we said before, there's no physical system meaning qubit technology that's yet been determined the best choice for quantum networking. Um, I'll, there's a lot of promising systems. I think you're asking if you can do the whole network with just photonics. And I think that would be difficult because there's no real memory component in a, in a photonic system. If you wanna store a photon, you have to put it in a resonator and let it uh, spin, uh, circle the resonator, but then you're limited in how long you can do that. So I think you're gonna want some matter-based qubit to serve as a memory at the very least, but probably the matter-based qubits will be helpful in other ways as well. Excellent. Natalie, you have something something there? 
No, I have pretty much agreed with what Kathy Ann just said. All right. Uh, yeah, I think that's a uh, tip. That's, that's great. Um, a point of agreement, and then that's an answer to that question is, in general, you know, we think about photonic qubits as a way to transmit information because this is what we do anyways already with a bunch of photons in fibers. But I think there is a sense of agreement that in order to process them, store them, and do some of the more difficult operations that are network related, such as buffering and error correction and so forth, we need forms of matter qubits that can interact with those photons, right? And in a sense, that's a challenge, but that's also that's a beautiful part where one start building these light matter interfaces that then, you know, we can work on PhD thesis for students forever, right? So then that's, that's part of the, of the nice thing. So here's another question um, from David. Maybe Katian can, can help us there with the plans. He, he's asking, has anyone tried entanglement between a trapped ion and a superconducting qubit? Did they succeed? Are there plans to do it? Would it even work? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and to my knowledge, no one has tried. People are thinking very hard, including uh, us at AFRL, um, just how to connect an, a trapped ion with a superconducting qubit. You know, they're, mu they're two of the most different qubit technologies you can come across. The atoms have an optical qubit that they emit, and the superconducting qubits work in microwave. The superconducting qubits only work in a dilution refrigerator at millikelvin temperatures, whereas the ions can either be room temperature or a lot of experiments have been done at 4K. Uh, to my knowledge, no one's ever put an ion trap yet in a millikelvin temperature regime. And so I, I think there's a, a lot of good ideas out there, but exactly how people are gonna do that is still an open question. Um, and it's mostly because these are two very, very different qubit technologies. But yes, pe people hope to do that in the future. <laughs> Natalie? Um, I mean, it sounds very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, the first part is that there isn't a good way to get microwave photons to turn into optical photons with high fidelity, low noise, high efficiency. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that's a very interesting sort of frontier of research. And there's a lot of um, it's, a, it's another one of these spaces where there's actually a lot of very, very different physical technologies that people are looking at that, um, that don't even look like each other, like really, really, really very different. So I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of the Wild West where there's a lot of, a lot of exciting stuff that's going on. Um, so there's sort of that fundamental uh, tech technology that needs to be developed and there's a lot of activity in. Um, and then, well, I guess once you do that, maybe it's not, maybe Kathy Ann can say, but it doesn't seem like when, once you have that part, then you just need to find some way to get the photons on resonance or something with each other, which um, once you're already doing microwave to optical, then maybe bridging whatever that, <laughs> that optical transition frequency difference is, is not a huge deal because you can just pick your pump laser or something uh, appropriately. But um, I don't know if that's too glib. I think um, it's still challenging, even if you get the optical photon out, <laughs> it's not at exactly the right frequency. But yeah, no, I mean, it's a fun problem to think about and it'll be a, a fun problem to, to try and solve. <laughs> I think one, one of the things that came out of this discussion, which I think is a bit the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about much is, is, is transduction between all kinds of different things and states and and <laughs> devices and, and 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 that that is really one of the big challenges that that we have how, how to get from a to b um whether it's from quantum computing to quantum networking or, or anything like that right I, I think perhaps to to put things into perspective and i think it is a, it is a big elephant <laughs> um in the sense that technically it's very hard right if you look into what are the state of the art in these things, right? Um, in order to couple microwave photons into optical or telecom photons, right? There is being a few realizations. And I think there is non photon to photon transduction yet, right? There is something along the lines of maybe 100 photons to perhaps tens of photons with low efficiency, right? But, but that is still a very big problem, right? People are looking into combining optomechanical resonators with the superconducting resonators, Maybe you know coupling uh, atoms in there close to a resonator to then use transitions to couple that. 
But I think the main the main problem, right, is how to do this with high efficiency. I think, as Natalie pointed out, it's um, it's tough, right? So that's that's a tough problem. So I think that that is one of the big questions that if you really want to build um, distributed quantum computing systems, that in a sense need to be need to be addressed, right? High so, efficiency and low noise. And and the question you can, you can the, always make things arbitrarily efficient by pumping them really, really hard, but then you right. got to ask where the noise went. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fair enough. That's uh, that's the quantum the quantum problem there that has to be solved, right? Um, I think maybe one one of the options here, and Kerstin commented my comment on this a little bit um, when it was assigned this um, this program of the DOE to look into things, right? This is why one has to look into the things that you can do at the beginning. Right to keep the excitement rolling, and then people get excited for all the stuff that's happening, and then through that development and through the years, start tackling these more complicated problems that then leads to um, to to an ultimate quantum Internet of Things. Right. Um, all right. Uh, now, in the in the last part of the of the conversation, and this this has been great. Thank you so kindly for really sharing your opinion with us. I want to talk a little bit about the, the landscape that now we're trying to build, right? So I think some of you have been involved in super high-end discussions, right? Once there is so much interest, and, and this, is, this is a beautiful thing about this quantum internet stuff, right? It's like it, it went beyond just physics toys and you know, wonderful PhD thesis into something that has a lot of impact and national relevance. And the moment that happens, the politicians get involved and then there has to be a way that us as scientists can talk to the politicians so then the right decisions can be made, right? Of course, that's a big question mark, but I think you have involved in, in many of these programs and I wanted to ask you to give us a, a description uh, on, on how you came about making these programs to define the pathway forward and what kind of discussions you have with, with the politicians, right? At what level they get involved and what kind of decisions they take and so forth. So maybe we can start with Kirsten and you could tell us a little bit about how do you go about organizing the, the quantum internet workshop? You know, what kind of interactions you have with the, with the higher people in the OE and perhaps other agencies that then lead to say, okay, we have to do this. And then once you have the answers, how do you implement? Yeah, I think that as, as I pointed out at the start, what one of the roles of computer science research at the national labs and other research areas actually as well, is to look at the future. What, what will the nation need uh, to solve their, their challenges in the future? What technologies do they need? What challenges do we have now that we can't solve with current um, capabilities that we have and technologies and what could be a different solution? And uh, quantum just turned out to be one of those, those areas. Um, many different aspects, quantum computing in terms of can we calculate things that we just cannot calculate on, on uh, classic computers. Quantum networking um, in helping us, as I said, to, to improve the, the measurements that we can make that help us to, to, to accelerate scientific discovery um, for, for the nation or using the network to secure communication where, where it's really needed. Um, and so, so, so those discussions happen first that we say there's, there's something there. It's reached a level of, of uh, maturity, not, not to the point that you can go out in the shop and buy it, but it's something, there's a proof of concept that this could be the right direction to go in. And then you start talking about it, start exploring it. Uh, where could it be used? Uh, you start talking to the agencies. Um, and then maybe put put a workshop together where we say, okay, let's let's get together, see, get all the experts together, let's see what the technologies are out there, where are we, and and where can this go, could could this go? Um, put a workshop report together as the blueprint workshop that we have, and then the next step is to go out and we to started that last year. We had uh, the the Quantum X Lab for for the DOE labs, where all seventeen labs came together. Um, to, to showcase what, what technologies are there and then talk to, to industry and academia to say, how would you use this? If, if this was there, how would you use it? What would you do with it? 
And um, that, that was very, very, very good because they had lots of ideas of what to do with it. Uh, if it was there, they also could give us um, very good input in terms of what quality of service would you have to reach? What parameters do you have to reach to make this interesting for them? And then with these kind of things, you, you can go higher up, you, you do reports, our politicians do read these reports and and uh, what what I've done and what, what others have done as well is there, there are then the, the subcommittees in, in the House and in the Senate that want more information on technologies. They've heard about it. Someone talked about, hey, there's quantum networking, there's quantum technology. Tell me more about it. What can you actually do? Explain it to me. Uh, what's the impact? What's the you know, financial impact? What's the impact in terms of capabilities that could be provided? And then they think about it and, and maybe put um, bills together to say there should be funding here uh, to direct the, the different agencies to invest in it and, and take this forward. And then obviously you have to, to, to show some progress over time <laughs> to, to continue that funding. But, but that's sort of the, the, the process, how it goes. And, and obviously while we often start with a relatively small kernel of people to, um, to start something off, certainly the Department of Energy is very good at reaching out um, to a broader community and, and not just in terms of more, more people in the same field, but um, as, as both Natalie and, and, and Kathy Ann have said, particularly for quantum networking, it's not just a quantum problem that you're solving. You, you need to talk to many other communities. Uh, so, um, the, and, and that's where the national labs can, can uh, really play a big role because we have material scientists here. We have people that work in quantum computing. We have people who have applications uh, in terms of science that, that want to use it. Bring them all together and say, okay, what this co-design, how, how does this all have to fit together to work? Where do we have to make improvements? What skills do we need to make those improvements? And, and bring them together, which, which is always highly exciting to, to do that and, and really push this, this forward to, to attack a grand challenge. Thank you, Kirsten. I think that sort of brings together um, a big picture of all the, the work that goes behind the supports that needs to be gathered such that then these large programs can be launched, right? And I mean, kudos to you for always pushing these this, this ideas, this agenda, up to the next, I think you have been one of the most staunch defenders of the quantum internet uh, nationwide, and definitely all of us thank you for that, right? You're um, welcome, here, but I'm not fortunately not the only one. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> um, here's a question for from Ann, right? I um, I was talking to some people, and then I I get to know that uh, in the White House of all other places, there is a there is a group <laughs> of people uh, that I probably live there, and and you know they have a wonderful time. <laughs> um, that are in charge of doing the quantum coordination of all these programs, right? Here we're talking about quantum internet, but of course there is quantum computing, there is quantum materials, there are so many different things. Um, there was this report, right, that is called a coordinated approach to quantum networking research that I think you were part of, of, of that conversation. Maybe could you please give us some insights about what happened? How do you go about it? How do you talk to these policymakers, and and you know how does interaction go? I think there's something interesting to to learn. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yes, I, I was fortunate to be involved in that in that document, the coordinated approach to quantum networking research. So there's a website called quantum.gov um, where that document and others like it can be found. I, I believe the blue quantum internet blueprint is also up there. But yeah, uh, so uh, many different agencies came together. I think as people started to talk and program officers and program managers talked, we realized it's unlikely that any one agency is going to solve the quantum internet or a quantum networking problem alone. And so it, it made its way high, higher up. And, and we had a, an interagency uh, meeting or a working group, if you will. And then it was there that we decided, you know, it's going to take all agencies working together. So we really need to come up with a plan. And, and that's essentially what that document reflects is how the agencies can work together and uh, you know uh, balance each agency's needs with, with the bigger problems to find a, a happy medium and way to work together to start to solve these very difficult problems that we've talked today, talked about today. 
And so, yeah, that was, that was fun to be a part of. And, you know, I, I think what also came out of that document is that it's not just interagency within the U S but it's actually going to take an international collaborative effort. And we also have to reach out to our international partners. Um, you know, like we discussed, many of them are making great progress like the Netherlands group that we talked about today and others. And so I, I think that was the, the biggest, Two, two things from that document is one, we need to work together, of course, and also we can't do this by ourselves, so we should reach out and, and find better ways to collaborate with our international partners as well. Wonderful. Did you go to the White House? Did you have a good time? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't get to go to the White House. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, you know they show this slide where they have this office there, and I'm like, hey, how would that be? Doing quantum in the White House <laughs> sounds very interesting. So here's a question <laughs> for you, Natalie. I think the just so then that will be the last question, I guess, of the panel because Kirsten needs to, needs to go to prepare for, for a very important visit. Um, you know, there is this term, right? Collaboration, coordination, right? You are a prime example of a person that is now collaborating with national labs, right? In the context of, of these uh, quantum computing centers and, and you are leading some of the efforts um, in this C2QA center uh, together with BNL. So let me ask you a question. And, and I always love your answers because you say the way it is, which is great. Um, how do you go about collaborating with national labs, right? Sometimes things are not easy because, you know, people speak different languages, the administrative hurdles to, to go about going to the bottom line and doing the science might be different. And, you know, these are things that need to be sorted out in order for, you know, people like you that have labs and, and your colleagues, et cetera, to work efficiently with the national labs so then things can go in direction facilities and so forth. So can you tell us a little bit about your interaction with, with the national lab folks and, and what do you think has to be done so then this interaction can be done efficiently? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually a very interesting question that I spend more time working on than I would like. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so, so maybe, maybe I, would, I would sharpen the challenge to say that, um, you know, I think there's there's sort of two aspects to it. One is that the national labs and the Department of Energy historically did not really invest in quantum information science. So it's a relatively recent uh, development that they have decided that this is, you know, a worthwhile investment. And now they're making enormous investments in it, right? So there's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, there have always been, you know, pockets of people doing QIS related research, but there has never been a big sort of coordinated push in this direction. Um, and, um, you know, we talked a lot about like policy and decision-making. Um, one of the funny things about the way that a lot of these agencies work is that you spend a large fraction of your time defining the boundaries that circumscribe what, your, <laughs> what, what you see your mission as. So I think sort of breaking, you know, that it means that you're going to be walking into, there's a certain cultural background, like, you know, we see ourselves as only working on fundamental research. So things that are too applied are, are outside, you know, the boundaries of what we're usually, and, and it affects things like who's going to be reviewing beamline proposals. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like a very systemic kind of, uh, kind of thing. Um, the other maybe big, challenge uh, is that, um, um, you know, so we have this, uh, this NQIS center uh, that you mentioned, uh, the co-design center for quantum advantage, and, and it's a, you know, really incredible opportunity. It's this really amazing collaborative environment where you really have a lot of groups that would not normally sit together and troubleshoot really prosaic things like why is our metal sputtering not working well? <laughs> They'll all just, you know, hop on Zoom and actually troubleshoot it together. So that's really exciting. Um, and then the other big exciting opportunity is that Brookhaven has all of these amazing user facility resources, uh, right? So the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 uh, is I think the brightest light source in the world and has all of these really beautiful new beam lines um, and, and things like that. Um, so maybe maybe what I would say is, is sort of a challenge is you have all of these QIS groups that have never done beamline research. Like they would not see it as inside of the purview of the kinds of things that they do. And then conversely on the beamline side, the way that the proposal cycle timing works and the kinds of proposals that, you know, in, that, that review well and things like that tend to not be the types of exploratory and application focused work 
that people on the QIS side are going to be interested in, right? So the people on the QIS side wanna say, I'd like to discover whether or not this beamline is good for this particular task. But what the beamline proposal reviewers wanna see is we know that this beamline is good for this exact task. We already have mounds and mounds of preliminary data. And all that we need is this one chamber where we can heat to a hundred degrees hotter <laughs> than, than our prior data set. And we know that that's going to result in a paper. So I think it's just, um, there's a little bit of a mismatch. And I think, uh, you know, my group had already been working. We were actually NSLS1 users uh, on the, the diamond surface stuff. Um, so I think, you know, I, I'm just a dumb experimentalist. So I like to do things from the bottom up. And what we're currently doing is just trying to um, have a number of pairwise collaborations, you know, where there's a really particular task working together with Beamline scientists and other scientists at Brookhaven to show that the collaboration can work and work really effectively. And then the hope is that once you have a blueprint, then everybody else can just sort of copy that blueprint. And the aim is to make this kind of blueprint more broadly available than just inside the center, but to really kind of show the rest of the community that this is this is a worthwhile path. Wonderful. So um, this has been fantastic. Honestly, I could keep talking with you for the next eight hours and still keeping finding out challenges, what we have to do. I think the message is this area is wonderful. There's a lot of bright minds that are working on this and the opportunities are immense for in the next 10, 20 years, keep pushing the envelope and try to get some, some wonderful realizations with all the efforts of all the agencies and institutions. I think we have to come to a close of the panel. It's kind of sad because I'm really enjoying this. So let's close the panel with a one final idea, some sort of motivation idea for all the people that were in the panel. And then we let Kirsten go because there are important things that she has to do later today. So why don't we start with Kerstin? One last final comment there to, to close out the, the panel. I think quantum networking is sort of just at the cusp of, of, of making the big breakthrough to, to many, many different applications. And that's what's exciting. It's, it's the new frontier of science. Fantastic. We're recording this, right? So this is great. Think about this because we're going to have it playing again and again. Excellent. Natalie, one final comment. Yeah, I think um, uh, the, the thing that's really exciting about the phase that we're in right now is that there's a lot of room for people to do both fundamental research and, uh, you know, very directed applied technological research. So it means that a field that has historically just been, you know, dominated by physicists, I think now can really um, benefit from completely new entrants from many different disciplines. Uh, and it's, and it's, an exciting time because all of these different groups of people can work together. Fantastic. KTM, one last comment. Yeah, I, I think as we said, you know, quantum networking is just on the cusp of, of some great breakthroughs. And so I think the next five or 10 years are going to be incredibly exciting for quantum networking. And we're going to learn a lot of fun things. Fantastic. Well, you heard from the experts. Go now, contact your professor and start doing your master's or your PhD in quantum networking, all right? And so we thank you very kindly, everybody that was in the panel today, of course, our experts, that was a wonderful conversation. And we thank also all the attendants. Uh, you heard a lot of different things here, right? And then we'll see you then back again on Monday. We have still two days of, of wonderful talks and conversations. So thank you very much and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you,